once before the Lamb of God and sing, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You guys may be seated. 
Yes. Amen, hey? Isn't that just, just the sweetest? Just to honor him. It's just beautiful. I love it. It sounded like a choir out here. It was good. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Father, we pray your blessing on our families. Families are under attack in our nation from birth all the way to death. There is an enemy afoot, a beast, who desires to destroy the works of your hands. And so, Father, one of those works is the beautiful nature of the family, mom and dad, kids. Father, we pray your blessing on every family. Pour each home, into each home, abundant grace. May the marriages that are here represented in this room be strong and vibrant for Jesus. Lord, may the discipline of the children and the, the nurturing and the growing them up, Lord, may it be full of the wisdom from on high and not the wisdom of this world. Father, just ask your blanket blessing on our families. In Jesus' holy name. Now, Lord, as I come to the scripture, <clears throat> may the words of my mouth... The meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight alone. My God, my rock, and my redeemer. Help us, Holy Spirit, understand your word today. And may we leave encouraged in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, invite you to open your Bibles up to the book of Revelation. And we're going to start into chapter 14 today, and uh, it is meant to be encouragement today. We've had so many heavy services, you know, talking about the dragon and the beasts and all that, and, and of course we know underneath it all is the victory of Jesus, but still just talking about it, naming the name, so to speak, of the dragon and his two beasts can be such a heavy topic, and there's so much chaos and, and wickedness in the world, and it's pretty obvious and it's also pretty heavy at times. And so this morning, I sensed in the spirit that we should change directions and just focus on the saints uh, of the living God, of the Lamb of God, who carry his name, who have been marked by the name of the Lamb and his Father, and how we are to move forward from that, and what that mark looks like, what it represents. Uh, so chapter 12 and 13, obviously, uh, we were looking at how as disciples of Jesus, as long as we live in this world, we will be in the midst of a cosmic battle, the battle of good and evil, the battle for the souls and hearts and minds of human beings. It's a battle. It's not a walk in the park and it's not a picnic. It is definitely a battle. The slain lamb has won the ultimate victory, but the unholy trinity of the dragon, the beast from the sea, and the beast from the land, that unholy trinity seeks to wage war constantly against those who worship God and carry the mark of the lamb on their foreheads. He is furious because he has been defeated, and he is waging war against the saints. All who display his character <clears throat> lived out as the way of the lamb. In an effort to mimic the uh, counterfeit uh, and, uh, and counterfeit the things of God, the beast also puts a mark on the foreheads and the right hands of his followers. This mark is on display. It is the character of the beast, the deceiver, the liar, and the pretender. This mark marks the soul. It marks the character. It marks those who do not worship and honor the king, the lamb, and his father by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so last week, we ended up the message by looking at 666, the number of his name. Anytime name is mentioned in scripture, many times name is mentioned in scripture, it has to do with revealing character especially when it relates to spiritual things, like the name of God. His name reveals his character. And so too, names are changed throughout the scripture to reveal character. And so when we are marked with the beast, his name, his number of his name is 666. And we all went to math school together and we decided together that six will always be less than seven. 
Did we not? Yeah. Seven is the number of God. Anything tripled, anything, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Trinity, anything times three is complete. And so the number of God complete is seven, seven, seven. And the mark of the beast, who is the mimicker, the great pretender, is what? Six, six, six. Not quite good enough. Not quite good enough. Not quite good enough. Triple six, complete incompleteness. This is the mark of the beast. And that mark carries with it, because it's his name, it carries with it the characteristics of being beast-like. And sometimes we willingly know this, and other times we are unaware. And the fellowship of God can help us with our imperfections as we rub on each other the glory of God we reveal, it reveals the character flaws that need to be worked on by the Holy Spirit. All right, well, this morning, we want to flip the dial. We want to look at what this mark looks like, the mark of the Lamb and his Father on his followers according to these passages found in Revelation. There's obviously much more to it than just what these passages bring. But in the context of the book of Revelation, and in the context of just having spoken again about 666, God brings up the number that he puts on the forehead of his people. And we want to look at what that character trait is in starting in chapter 14, and we're going to read the first uh, five verses there, and then we're going to jump ahead. It's going to become like a sandwich. So this week we're going to look at the top layer of bread and the bottom layer of bread, and next week we'll look at the stuff in the middle. And it needs to be sandwiched by this great knowledge of the mark that God puts on his people, us, the followers of Jesus. Okay, let's begin with Mark, uh, Revelation rather, uh, 14, starting at verse 1. Then I looked, and there before me was a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing waters, like the loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women or have kept themselves pure. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They are purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and to the lamb. No lie is found in their mouths. They are blameless. Now skip ahead to Revelation 15. Let's look at the verse four verses there. And I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is complete. And I saw and looked like, and I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And standing beside or on, that's two, a word that can mean two things, beside or on the sea, were those who had been victorious over the beast and his image, and over the number of his name. Hallelujah. They held harps given to them by God, and sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, and your righteous acts have been revealed. Awesome. Let's just dive right in. So, back, in, back up to uh, chapter 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. What does this mean? Well, as we've studied through the book, there's a few things I want to draw attention to. Number one. In the book of Revelation, remember, it's apocryphal literature. 
It is not meant to be linear. You don't read this and then, oh, what happens next is this, and then, oh, what happens next is this. It's not written that way. As you probably guessed by now, we're halfway through, you should know. It's cyclical. It comes around, and it darts to and fro, and you've got to kind of keep your uh, mind going, and the, the clue is that it's about what John sees. So it's not about what happens next. It's about what John sees next. That's how we're to keep, our, keep track of what's going on through this book. It's very helpful. He sees a lamb standing. This lamb is not the lion. It's very important that we distinguish this. And I haven't got time today to kind of break it down except to say this. God has chosen to win the war against the dragon and the beasts and their followers. How? By loving sacrifice. That's how God has chosen. He hasn't come with force to defeat them. He's come by the way of the lamb. Not the lion, the lamb. And he offers himself up to his enemies. That is something. The king of the ages, the creator of all things, submitted himself to all that evil could throw at him. And then what happened? Up from the grave he arose, hey, with a mighty triumph over his foes. They did not see it coming. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. Amen. All right. So not the way of the lion. It's the way of the lamb. The way of sacrifice. The way of loving sacrifice. The way of witness of the loving sacrifice. That is the way of the lamb. That's how God has chosen to have victory over the beast and the dragon. God did not win the victory over rebellious nations through the exercise of superior force. The church and people in the church are always tempted to take the way of superior force. That's the temptation. And that is not the way of the lamb. The lamb is to submit to the superior force. Oh, that does not sit well. It doesn't. Because we think we've got to push back. We've got to fight back. We've got to take what they give us and give them a bit more. That's generally how we think. But that is not the way of the lamb, folks. The church is not meant to wield the sword. It's not like a lion. It is lambs. That's who we are. In fact, we're called lambs to the slaughter. Look at your neighbor and say, you are a lamb to the slaughter. Come on, remind each other, you are a lamb to the slaughter. Okay, now be encouraged, hey? Isn't that encouraging? <laughs> the, the encouragement, though, is this, that in God's economy, when we do this, we win. And only when we do this, the moment Jesus died, is the moment the enemy lost. And he had no idea, because all he thinks about is power and pleasure. And all Jesus thought about was death and suffering. And through that, he won. He won. This is the book of Revelation, folks. Hallelujah. And it's written with colorful language to inspire not our brains. It's to inspire our imaginations of what heaven perceives as what's really going on. All is not as it seems. Amen? This is apocrypha literature. Jesus even said at one point in Matthew 16, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This is no misleading t text. This is exactly what you are called to do as disciples of Jesus. Follow him. The way of the lamb. The way of sacrificial love. That's how we're to fight. That's how we're to fight. 
Jesus went further. He said, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. If you're hanging on to your life and you're hanging on to your rights and you're hanging on to your, your uh, position and you're hanging on to whatever it is you're hanging on to, it will be stripped from you. But if you lose your life, you'll find it in God's economy. It's the exact opposite of what we're taught in school, everywhere, in our homes. You've got to be the best to succeed. No, according to Jesus, you have to be the least to succeed. It's the opposite. It's the upside down world. Turn to your neighbor and say, you sure look upside down. Okay. <laughs> Mount Zion. So this is a beautiful picture. If you know anything of the Old Testament especially, but it's mentioned a few times in the New Testament too. Mount Zion is this poetic figure. It's, um, it's literally, uh, I can't even say literally, because it's, it's poetic. It is poetic description of the city of God. And the mountain part often is attributed to the mountain that's outside the city that Jesus was slain on. Zion. That is Mount Zion. It's right there that the Lamb is standing. You know, if you've been crucified 99.9 of the 10 of the times, you're not standing anymore, are you? Except for one person. Three days later, ah, he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead, never to die again. He stands. He stands because he's triumphant. He stands because he's the victorious king. He stands because he has conquered death and sin forever. He stands on Mount Zion. And in the scriptures, especially uh, Psalm 2, we read a lot about this mountain. In this, in Psalm 2, by the way, is kind of like the it's kind of like the, the way of understanding the rest of the Psalms. And actually, it is the most quoted Psalm in the New Testament, Psalm 2. And if you just read it quickly, which we want to do today, I will just tell you what it says. You can check it out later. Maybe I'm wrong. You can correct me, which I know that's some fun for sure. In this Psalm, the nations are in an uproar. They're all clamoring to get rid of God and his stupid, restrictive commandments. That's my paraphrase. Okay, that's what they want. They don't want to live under God's commands. And so they gnash their teeth and they shake their fists at God and it says that God laughs at them. <laughs> you know, you little creatures. It's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm God the Father, I know. He scoffs and he mocks them. That's how silly man's anger is to God. And so he has a solution. He says, he responds with great fury and wrath and instructs the world to, that he will establish his king, his son, on Mount Zion. This is where it comes from. And give all the peoples of the world over to the king on Mount Zion. Then he warns the world that you need to kiss the son. That just means to be subject to. You need to kiss the son and if you do that, you will find this king that God puts on Mount Zion a refuge, a safe place. But if you refuse to kiss the sun, then you will face the full fury of his everlasting wrath. You see, the lamb has some wrath too. Now this is a side, and I'll just tell it quickly because it comes from YouTube. But I was looking at sheep you, uh, to YouTube pick, uh, videos of sheep. And this one shepherd, he gets up, and he's leading his sheep across the road. And in New Zealand, it happens all the time. You gotta watch, you come ripping around a corner and there's a flock of sheep. And you gotta kinda hit the brakes and the shepherd tries to hurry everybody across. And so this shepherd realizes, oh, I'm, I'm holding up traffic. So he tries to hurry the sheep up. And so he's kinda moving them along. And this one goat does not wanna be told what to do. Or sheep, rather. This ram doesn't wanna be told what to do. So this guy's hurrying, trying to put, and this, this ram just comes up from behind, full tilt, and nails the shepherd. And of course, the shepherd falls. 
And then he gets back up and he goes, you know, what are you doing? And he tries to push that lamb away. And then he, he looks at the other sheep and he's trying to get them across the road. And the same thing happens. This thing comes three times, knocks them flat. The third time, the shepherd did not get up and the video stopped. I thought, what happened? What's the rest of that story? I don't know. Anybody know? <laughs> Anybody know? I don't know. But I know that sometimes that can happen. Even the sheep can get a little upset. And they got upset with that shepherd. And here we find that this sheep has wrath. Well, <clears throat> let's keep going. There are two mountains that are famous in the scriptures. One is Mount Sinai. Anybody know what happens on Mount Sinai? The law, the Ten Commandments are given. The mountain is on fire. And it freaks the people out so bad they ask God not to speak to them anymore. Just to speak to Moses and Moses can talk to us. That's how they ask. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the second mountain is called Mount Zion. It's the exact opposite. So in the first mountain, Sinai, there's a separation between God and his people. But on Mount Zion, they come together in holy fellowship. Hebrews 12, says, you have come to Mount Zion. This is those of you who believe in Jesus. To the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, with thousands upon thousands of angels, all joyfully assembled. That's how we've come together with God on Mount Zion. So we are the 144,000. I've already gone into the numbers. It basically means a, a group so big that it can't be counted. That's what that means. That's what 144,000 means. And they carry the name of the Lamb and His Father, written as a mark on their foreheads. And as I said before, it needs God, the Holy Spirit instructed John, Pastor John, to give us a fresh vision of this mark rather than carry the mark of the beast on in the conversation. That mark is gone for those of us who follow the Lamb. Hallelujah. So what does this mark look like then of the Lamb, the one of the Lamb and his Father? What does that mark look like? Well, I think there's seven different ways it's described here. So let's look at verses two and three. <clears throat> and I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like the loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of a harpist playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed on the earth. Okay, this is helpful. This lets us know that those who have victory are a part of this 144,000 and they alone can sing this song. Why? Because they have been redeemed. They've been purchased. If you remember back in Revelation chapter five, we are introduced to this lamb and this is what was being worshiped around the lamb. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. Remember the seven seals? He opened the seven seals because he was worthy. Why was he worthy? Because you were slain. He is worthy because he was slain. And with his blood, he purchased human beings for God from every tribe, language, nation, and people. You have come to them and made them to be a kingdom of priests who serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Yeah, only we are worthy because of the sacrifice of Jesus. That's what makes us worthy. And we'll be the only one singing that song. Nobody else can sing it. Isn't that cool? Only those who did not have the name of the beast written on them, only those who are stamped with the seal of God, they're the ones who will be singing. All right, so the first mark is that we know we are not our own. We are bought with a price. We are not our own. In fact, you could even say this means that we really don't have a say. We don't have a say. Only God has a say in how our lives end up. Now, that does not let us off the hook. 
And it does not for sure mean we don't pray to seek the heart of God, to see his hand move. Amen? But at the end of the day, we come humbly knowing that it's his blood purchased for us that even allows us to be there. His blood has purchased for us our salvation. So that is what they're singing. So the first mark of the believer is that they know who owns them. Who owns you? Do you own you? Because if you own you, you won't be singing with us on that day. You will not be singing. You'll be full of fear. In fact, one of the beautiful things about this, and the sad things, I can't give you it all at once, or we'd be here till three. But... It's a contrast because in the middle section, he talks about how the difference of the lamb, those who follow the lamb, and those who follow the beast. And one of them is that they worship. Our hearts are set free. We worship because we've been redeemed. We do not claim ownership over our lives. Jesus has stamped his seal of ownership on us. We are sealed and it is our destiny. This is very important, that when we walk and talk and do and live, we reflect our owner. That's how we do that. That's how we live out the Christian life, in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. When we live out our lives, we reflect the one who owns us, his life, his power pulsating through us. This is beautiful truth, that those who are marked with a lamb know. Second, they are also, the, 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 those who are marked, know that they are the bride of the Lamb of God. Now, this is a bit of a complicated passage because it kind of seems to demote women, so we'll be careful with it, ladies. Those of you, these are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They followed the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased, there it is again, from all men and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. So, this whole idea of being defiled, I, I think you have to be careful how you present this because if you just read it statement by statement, as literal, it puts women outside. Well, that's not what it means then. Because, ladies, you're here. And, ladies, you are marked with the seal, with the name of the Lamb and his Father. Amen, ladies? So what is this all about, defiling themselves with women? So what does it mean? They kept themselves pure. Throughout the Old Testament, sexual intimacy has always been used as an allegory for the relationship of Israel with God. Did you know that? It's used as an allegory. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 2, God calls Israel his betrothed lover, like a bride, We're a bride, we're betrothed, we're already purchased, we're already given to another, and his name is Jesus. But in Jeremiah 2.23, God speaks of Israel defiling that intimacy by lusting after other gods, and then he says they are lovers. Other things you worship are perceived by God as lovers, as lovers. Now, just think about your marriage. If you think your spouse is stepping out on you, how does that feel? Hey, come on. Angry, come on, upset, frustrating, stepping out. We're not to be stepping out. And so this text is saying do not commit adultery. Do not follow after other lovers. In Exodus 34, through Moses, these other lovers are called prostitutes. They're called harlots. They trick you in and rob you of your virginity, your innocence. You see? Now it makes sense. It's not against women. It's actually a way of saying from Old Testament language, be faithful, be faithful. The church in the New Testament is called his bride. We are his bride. And we're going to be going to the wedding feast of the bride, right? Hello? Are you with me? Yes, we are his bride. Even in the, later on in the book of Revelation, we are called that. We're called the bride of Christ, the bride of the Lamb. 
The, the redeemed know that they belong to one husband, and they are not caught sleeping around with other lovers. They are not in bed with the world. They are faithful. That's what that means. Hmm. All right. Third mark. First fruits, it mentions, which is an offering to God. It's a sacrificial offering to God. In ancient Jewish harvest time, they would take the first sheath of wheat and or whatever crop they were harvesting and offer it to God as first fruits, signifying the expectation and prayer that there would be much, much more. Isn't that great news? Much, much more. So they're the first fruits. The ones of this 144,000, they're the first fruits. And there's a whole biblical doctrine that wraps itself around this first fruits teaching. But I want to say this just as an aside. I find it interesting that we are called the first fruits because generally speaking, as this Old Testament uh, teaching is, it really was a symbol of more to come. Folks, we are not going to be just it at the end. There is, there is a great, great harvest of souls coming. The only question is, will we be part of it? That's the question. Will we be, will we be the ones Jesus lifts up our eyes and says the harvest is ripe, send out the workers? Are we going to help? That's the question. All right. <clears throat> There's another meaning behind firstborn, and that is that there's a promised inheritance to the firstborn. God promises the firstborn son of every Jewish family a privileged position, and he would receive extra blessings from the family inheritance. So that's the Old Testament way of doing things, right? So in the New Testament, however, every believer is the firstborn, is the first fruit of the womb. Every believer. So every single believer comes into the kingdom, joins God's family, and we are heirs of his promise. We are the first fruits. And so we need to start thinking like this, which is one of the reasons why I believe the mark of God is on our foreheads. It's a symbol of how you think. This week I've had several conversations with people and a lot of defeat coming out of their mouth, coming out of how they think. A lot of defeat. I can't read the Bible. You think that's true? Can you read the, you know, the latest blog, or can you read Facebook? Can you read Instagram? Oh, yeah, of course. Then why do you think you can't read the Bible? Well, it just makes no sense to me. Does everything on Instagram make sense to you? <laughs> no. It's a lie. You have believed a lie. The mark is on your forehead. Start thinking like the redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, it says in Scripture. So say it. I am redeemed. Come on, say it. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I am redeemed. Know in your mind that you are set free. Know it. And every time the old devil comes and whispers in your ear, no, you're not, you just shove him away in the name of Jesus. Say, yes, I am. I am the first fruits. I am. Amen. And you can even chop off the first part and just say, I am fruity. <laughs> All right. All right. Good. One final picture that comes with the first fruits is that God owns everything. That was another part of that sacrifice. He owns everything. And those who are carrying that mark, remember, he owns it all. We do not compartmentalize our lives. Well, God gets Sunday. Or God gets the first two hours or three hours or five hours of Sunday morning. Okay, he gets that, and the rest is mine. No, it's not. God gives, you know, I give God one-tenth of my income. The rest is mine. No, it's not. He owns everything. That's the meaning of first fruits. And we know it. And we are to think this way because the mark is on our forehead. Start thinking like a redeemed one. And let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen.
No lie was found in their mouths. Verse 5, they are blameless. The, the next mark, the next uh, distinguishing mark of the Lamb and the Father on the believer, and that is their goal, is to be just like Jesus. Just like Jesus. He never lied. He never will lie. In fact, he cannot lie. Even the scripture says the Lord, that God Almighty is not a man that he should lie. Because human beings lie. Come on now. We lie like sidewalks, my dad used to say. We lie. If we can pretend, if we can distract, if we can make the other person look more guilty than us, we will do so in the flesh. And that is a sign of the mark of the beast within us. We need to get rid of it. In Jesus' name, we need to stamp over that with 777. We lie and we pretend. In fact, I know, you know, we used to do this all the time because somebody taught us that from the book of Revelation that says all liars go to where? All liars go to hell. That is a very poor translation, but it's close. Because God despises pretenders. He even calls them wolves with sheep clothing on. And they're all around. There's maybe even some in this room. Wolves with sheep clothes. Clothes with sheep clothes on. He despises pretenders. And those who are marked seek to be like Jesus, learning to dethrone the lies that come to the mind first. And instead, the mark of the Savior, the mark of the Lamb and His Father, in their mind, no more lies. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Isn't there a song like that? A camp song, an old camp song. Anybody else know that song? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Anybody heard that? Yeah. Maybe we should bring that one back, eh, Stacy? Except it's very repetitious. That's it. That's the only thing you sing, and you just keep going up and up and up until nobody can sing it anymore. Do you remember that, Kev? <laughs> All right. Anyway. Okay. Now, blameless. They do not lie, and they are blameless. Blameless does not mean perfect. It does not mean that. It means that they seek to make things right when they get things wrong. When you get things wrong, you seek to make things right. That's what blameless means. You seek to make it right. If you've offended another, you lay your gift down at the altar beforehand and you go and you make it right, Jesus said. That is the power of making things right. It puts relationships back together. And that's what Jesus wants. Blamelessness is about being together. We have a common confession. We do. We have many common confessions. This is our admission that we fail and that we seek God to make it right. That's how we do it. That is a mark of the follower of the Lamb. I remember stealing a chocolate bar and I got caught and I did not want to face my father's wrath and so I pled for mercy and confessed my sins. And the store owner was gracious enough to let me give the chocolate bar back. I had hidden it in my gum boot. So I reached in, I pulled it out, I gave it to him. And you know what? He told my mom and dad anyway. <laughs> ah, I've been there, done that. <laughs> All right. Okay, the fifth and distinguishing mark is that they follow the lamb. This is the gospel. Jesus said, as I read earlier, if you will follow me, take up your cross daily and follow me. That's what we are called to do. All of us, folks, are disciples. <clears throat> now get, hear this correctly. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> we are all disciples of something, of someone. You see, a family is a little bit like a disciple-making factory. Mom and dad discipling their kids how to live life. 
That's what discipleship is. And so all of us are disciples. At some point, we follow someone else. We are all sheep. Just remind yourself, sitting here this morning, you are a sheep. Okay? Sheep follow. We all follow something or someone. Who do you follow? That is the question. The mark of the believer is that they have given up following after themselves and following after something else. Maybe it's somebody on TV or maybe it's somebody on YouTube that you follow. Be careful about who you follow. Following is the mark of discipleship. And they, the lamb, the the followers of the lamb, follow the lamb wherever he goes, it says. Wherever he sends us, wherever he goes, that's where we go. We follow him. Because that is the nature of discipleship. And as I said, you were all disciples. We all of us are. Who are you a disciple of? Who do you spend most of your time with? What do you spend most of your time in front of? What gets your attention more frequently than anything else? What is it? Because whatever it is, you are following. You're not following at the lamb, the lamb at that point. Follow the lamb wherever he goes. Say that with me. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. That could be a good song, Stacy. Write us a song. Follow the lamb wherever he goes. Okay, this is a distinguishing mark of those who are his saints. We wrestle with following because we have our own desires, our own plans, our own goals, the own things we want. We want our own attention, but that's not how the followers of the Lamb think. All right, skipping ahead to chapter 15, let's look at the next couple, and then we'll take a look at a song. So he sees heaven open, and a great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the last seven plagues. Now remember, we're still in an interlude. We had the seven seals, we went through the seven trumpets, and we're coming to the seven bowls. We're still in the interlude. It's just been such a long interlude. (laughs) We're gonna get out of this soon. Verse two, and I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Interesting. And standing on the sea or beside the sea, either one works were those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. They had conquered the beast within themselves. Hallelujah. Come on now. They conquered the beast within themselves. They held harps given to them by God and sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. All right. What does this all mean? And then we'll get to the song. So the sea with, mixed with fire, interesting description. It's coupled up with the song of Moses. So if you think back, what sea did the people of Israel stand through and on the other side of the shore? The, the Red Sea. Fire is red. This is a picture of a, of a sea mixed with fire. Now, we've learned already about the sea. The sea represents chaos. It represents the monsters. The first beast came out of the sea. And so what you have here is you have the saints going through and standing on or standing on the other side in victory over the beast. Hallelujah. And it's a picture of a brand new way of crossing through the Red Sea, only this time with Jesus and not just Moses. So it takes Moses' song, and if you compare the two, there's lots of similarities. It takes Moses' song of deliverance, and it adds the song of deliverance of the Lamb, and then this is the song that the saints are singing with all these wonderful harps. So those of you who can't play now, someday you will play a harp. I'm just kidding. It's just a picture of music. If you want to, you can, though. All right. So they are standing on the other side. They are victorious over the beast, his image, and the number of his name. They've walked through the fire. They've walked through, and God's purifying fire 
has made them good. And this is one of the marks. They are victorious and they know it. They walk in victory even though they stumble. Isn't that interesting? The sea is glass mixed with fire. We're working our way through. So this is very good theology because theology is what we have now is salvation, but we also don't have it quite at all yet. We don't have quite all of it yet. So we have now and we have some to come. Are you with me here? Are you following the theology? So in other words, we're not perfect yet. So just turn to your neighbor and remind them you're not perfect. Come on. Yeah, you're not perfect. <clears throat> All right. So you're, you're working your way through the Red Sea. You're getting to the other side of the shore. It says you've already won the victory, but you're working it through. You're starting to find victory over lying. Hey, you're starting to find victory over cheating. You're starting to find victory over anger. You're starting to find victory over hang-ups, hurts, and habits. Those of you who are in uh, CR, right? Yeah, there you are. Yeah. You're starting to work your way through. You're starting to know. I I'm victorious. I I'm working my way through this chaotic sea called life like the Israelites walking through the Red Sea, getting to the other side. Now, it can also mean, that word can also mean on. They're standing on the sea, and that is a picture of victory. When you stand on something, it's picturing your victory. It's good. They both work. Beside or on. This is how the scriptures display our purity and our holiness. Thank you, Jesus. He makes us holy. How many of you cannot wait till the day when no more sin anywhere? Come on now. Yeah. yeah. No more sin. Yippee. That is heaven. Yippee. Yippee. Good cowboy somewhere back there. <laughs> Yippee! All right, no more sin. I don't think it enters into the heart of mind of man what that looks like. We all carry this heavy burden constantly of sin and chaos that we live in. But Jesus makes our burden light. He makes our burden easy when we follow him. We follow him as his disciples. So the next mark is that they know they are victorious. They overcome him, it says in Revelation 12. We learned this already. By the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, by their witness, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink back even from death. We know. You can't threaten me with a free trip to heaven. You can't. Because I am sold. I am bought. I am purchased by the blood of the lamb. I follow the lamb. I follow wherever he goes. I am the first fruits. I am redeemed. I am purchased. I begin to think because this is on my forehead. Like a true believer, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And they all sing together. I'd like you to put that up on the on the back here. Let's stand. Let's stand and sing this, well, sing this, say this together. If you want to sing, try it. I don't know. If you got a tune that comes to your head, here we are. Let's just say it out together. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. Your righteous acts have been revealed. You may be seated. I want you to notice something about this song. Did you notice? All the way up to the song, it's been about us, about the redeemed of the Lord saying so. It's been about following the Lamb. This song doesn't even mention us. Doesn't even mention us. Why? Because God will share his glory with no one else, not even his redeemed. Wow. This song is packed with scripture. It completely focuses on God himself. God has revealed himself through the word, through the scripture. 
If we're gonna sing about him, we need to get our words from the scripture because otherwise we end up worshiping something that we create because that's just how we're made. The song is totally God-oriented. It is not about themselves. They do not sing about what they have accomplished. They do not sing. They do not sing about the salvation that they have achieved. It's a free gift from God and they know it and they do not take credit for it. How about us? Is that how we speak? This is a poor beggar who found food and now is just sharing it with everyone else. Right? It's all about the king. As we sang earlier, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For to you are all things and you deserve the glory. We sang that before, and now it's echoed from the scriptures. Instead of a song today, we just sang this song, and I would love to know the music that goes with it. And as I've mentioned before, at least 16 times in this book, you end up in worship, worshiping the great God. You end up in prayer, praying that God moves on our behalf. Let's just take time right now to let this lavish truth soak its way in the marks of the lamb and his father on the character of his people. Just take a moment. We're going to just play some soft music. And uh, you think. You confess. You deal with God. I'll guide you through this, but that's what we're going to do for the next couple minutes.